everybody. We are in the second half of this Living Histories edition. It's now time for us to listen to Moens Jensen from Niels Bohr Institute. I'm so excited and so honored that you're going to be telling us about your living history. Thank you so much, Sri, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's really an honor. Uh, I, I uh, grew up on a farm 50 kilometers from Copenhagen and already in primary school and surely in high school I became very interested in mathematics and physics so it was a little bit obvious to study that. Now actually on the bachelor level I felt that uh, this wonderful institute though there were a little too many courses on quantum mechanics and I wanted to do something else. I became quite early interested in critical phenomena surely long before Biological physics, I come back to that. So I was lucky to meet the late Pierre Bach in 1979, and we immediately started collaboration. Some of you might know knew Pierre Bach, he was an expert on critical phenomena. And actually, our first paper, which was during my master thesis on helical magnetic structure, was amazingly enough, they voted a full chapter in Landau Lichich, Electrodynamics of Continuous Media. How, the reason I'd say that is in Russian, it says Bach and Jensen. However, in the English version, the two, our two names, Bach and Jensen, are translated to two Russian names and who had nothing to do with, with this uh, thing. And it's, I think after 30 years, it's still the two Russian names. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, I also did my PhD with Pierre Bach. It was a time where chaos and fractal became important. People call it chaos revolution. And I actually learned about chaos from Predrag Svitano, which I think he's on, and I'm very grateful for that. So it was completely obvious to go into that field and we could actually uh, do things there because it was kind of a virgin land and uh, my thesis wanted chaos in space and time. <clears throat> and we started to work on synchronization between two coupled oscillators. It's uh, called Arnold Tongs. I have a picture here. Uh, you have two oscillators that couple and they couple to all rational frequencies, extremely interesting uh, structure it has. And uh, we found some universality here. Now Pierre Bach actually moved to United States. So I went to spend half a year in US and I traveled to a lot of places, I think at least 10 places. And uh, I have to say after meeting Leo, the late Leo Kavanaugh at University of Chicago, it was for sure my dream to go there. And I succeeded to uh, become a postdoc with Leo. Uh, which was a fantastic time. So we I worked with Leo Kavanaugh of Alberti, Chabert, and Itamar Prokatscha. And in the fantastic years, uh, Chao Tang and I called it the golden years of Chicago. And people who came in the 90s, we were then in the 80s, they complained, they say, this was also golden years. And we tease them and say, no, it's the silver years. The golden years was really in the 80s. We developed what's called the multifractal if alpha spectrum uh, also has universality in it. And we actually did both the theory and experiment as you see here to the right. And it was incredible collaboration between theory and experiments, which I have pursued uh, later also in my career. <clears throat> After Chicago, I became an assistant professor at Nodita in Copenhagen. By the way, Nodita has uh, 15 years ago moved to Stockholm. That's another political issue, but it's a great place to be. And I started quite early to work with the Parisi group in Rome. I actually spent half a year sabbatical there. And it was to, uh, with my very close colleagues, Angelo Volpiano and Giovanni Palladin. Unfortunately, Giovanni died in the mountains already in 98, but we did a lot of papers together. And actually with Thomas Boer and uh, uh, Angelo and Giovanni, we wrote a book here, An Amical Systems Approach to Turbulence. So I worked on shell models for turbulence for many years. And it has against to do with critical phenomena scaling theory. Some of you probably know that there's a universal theory called Kolmogorov theory. And we looked at, at multifractal again, corrections to this. <clears throat> now, uh, now for several years, I have worked at the Nielsen Institute at, as we heard from Eva, it's a fantastic place. It, of course, a very historical place. By the way, this year we celebrate 100 year of Niels Bohr's Nobel Prize. Have a lot. Uh, we have a big party with the Queen in ten days. So that's another story. Except for the fact she got COVID today. We'll see. But uh, my interest always centered around dynamical system oscillations, chaos, scaling chaos, critical points, and so on. So uh, slowly, slowly, I worked on that for many years. But fifteen years ago, I began to see the first experiment oscillations 
of uh, transcription factors, P53 and nf cover b in single cells. You see some traces here by Uri Alon. And um, I thought that was uh, very, very interesting. So, so that was slowly my first interest uh, to biological physics. And uh, this is what we should talk about today, right? So it took me many years, but uh, we started to work using dynamical system models to what's uh, described reduced genetic networks. So simply try use dynamical systems to reproduce these uh, experimental data. <clears throat> And here I want to share two observations, which I, I have uh, think are quite important because I was used to do convection in Chicago where it was stable data for 14 days in a row. Biological data are very noisy. So it's completely different from uh, convection experiments and it's certainly not deterministic. So you have to use stochastic models. We used Gillespie models. And then I learned from many, on many conferences and I, uh, as you know, I had the Bohr Institute Niels Bohr told us to reduce problems to get understanding. So uh, we always reduce these uh, genetic networks to, to simpler models. And my bio biologist friends always ask, why do we reduce? You should have the full model. And I say, no, in order to understand the core and have fewer parameters, we should reduce. But many biologists, I realized at many conferences, don't appreciate this. So it's a difference between, interesting difference between physics and biology. <clears throat> now, what's really quite fantastic for me is that last around three, four years, I have come back to these Arnold tongues I showed in the very beginning. And it's kind of fantastic. So where uh, we did Arnold tongues uh, in Chicago with Albert Lipschabert, now I do the same for single cells. So why, how is that? Because a single cell I showed you before, some proteins oscillate. And then we can put external oscillator on. It can be a cytokine or a notlin, can also be temperature. And we have managed to get these uh, two internal oscillator, external oscillator in single cell to co couple. This is fantastic collaboration I have with Gadit Lahal at Howell Medical School. We exchange data uh, at least once a week. And here you see the fur, uh, we are finishing this up. You see Arnold tongues, of course, not as detailed and in, uh, in convection, but you see Arnold tongues for a uh, uh, single cell uh, P53 oscillations. And we can, I could show you lots of data, I cannot do it, but we can actually find them to reasonable uh, uh, accuracy. So at the end, I just uh, want to talk a little bit about why did we move into biological physics. Well, many of our students and postdoc, we actually got inspired by our mentor, Albert Lipschabert. It's Uri Alon, David Benjamin, Chao Tang, Boris Freeman, Ray Goldstein, I can mention the list is longer. And I think for me, it was really very early on, around 990, I would say four or something, he started to move into uh, bio logical physics or whatever you want to call it, systems biology, maybe from a theorist point of view. So I think many of us uh, on this list, and it's so much longer felt, it was a natural step to try to use all the techniques we learned in nonlinear dynamical system to look at the enormous amount of data, enormous amount of phenomena there are in biology and try to uh, model it, try to describe it by mathematics and physics. But as I write here, it took really a long way. What I do right now is to see how P53 oscillation can uh, influence DNA repair. You get P53 to oscillate if you do DNA damage. And uh, we have just recently found that it promotes what we call foci formation around the uh, repair sites and it leads to the uh, repair. And actually we have found that due to the uh, oscillations, the repair is optimal compared to if P53 uh, was a constant. And sorry to brag a little bit, but yesterday it was accepted in cell, actually in what's uh, called the theory section where there's only one and two papers a year. So we, we have already got a lot of response on this job. So I would say coming all the way from critical phenomena, um, dynamical systems, uh, complex uh, system in scaling and so on. I have, I'm now using this idea in, uh, in uh, cell dynamics and it uh, has been a fantastic journey. And right now I have 
some of the brightest young people I ever had in my group. So it's a great pleasure. With this, I want to thank you again, Sri, for this wonderful invitation. Um, thank you so much, Moen. So on behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Audience, if you have burning questions, please throw them into the chat. Let me start the questioning with a questioning for you, with a question for you, Moen, which is, um, which is that uh, you did tell us why it is that um, problems involving geometric interpretations drew your imagination, whether it was in the context of convention, convection or in the context of biology, geometrizing the problems was um, something that is a running theme in your work. So why that? Was there some early childhood influence? Did, did you say geometry? Did you say geometry? Yes. Ah, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> good question, but I, I like to visualize things. And, you know, in the convection experiment, we could visualize everything that went on because you have convection rolls and, uh, and uh, you know, you had instabilities and then we drew, we indeed drew all the geometry on, on the blackboard all the time. And it's completely true that uh, even it's a single cell that uh, uh, spatial understanding and how uh, the different protein interact and how these foci form, <laughs> it's surely also geometrical, um, uh, what should I say, approach. So, so you are absolutely right. That has meant a lot to me. Um, thank you, Moens. I'll ask one more question, uh, unless somebody else has a question that they would like to ask. Okay, so then uh, we'll take my question which is that um, you have done this very graceful navigation of being a famous person while also doing um, things that are new in new communities, such as moving to biological physics. Mm -hmm. So is there any secret to having it all? Uh, <laughs> I definitely felt, you know, as I told you in the very beginning that I felt I became very interested in critical phenomena scaling very early on in my studies. And I, I feel actually, honestly, I'm a little bit shy person, but I, I, I felt all the time I moved after my interest all the time. And after where I saw something new where I could use uh, um, some of um, the, the technique I learned, or maybe so uh, some new phenomenon that maybe we could model. So, to 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 the young people, <laughs> I would also say, in science and in in uh, research, you should follow your interest. And uh, Niels Bohr, I always quote him. He said, "To be a scientist has to come from inside. You cannot force it on people. Right? You have to develop." to be a scientist from inside. And uh, I think uh, this is very important. Well, on that very inspiring note, thank you so much on behalf of the audience. I'm closing the recording.